All right, welcome everybody. Um, uh, thank you all for attending this event uh, from wherever you're tuning in from. And I'm really looking forward to today's uh, discussion about class, race, and populism around the world. Uh, I wanna introduce this event um, and I wanna thank uh, the people who made this event possible. My name is Tej Nagaraja. I'm a professor at Cornell University and this event is brought to you by eCornell, uh, which hosts a whole range uh, of events. Uh, and it's also sponsored by the Ainaudi Center for International Studies at Cornell. And I wanna thank you all uh, for tuning into this event uh, uh, and hope it's a really uh, productive discussion. This event is part of a larger series um, that I'm leading called Class Race Global. Uh, and you can check it out uh, at twitter.com slash class race global, where we try to bring together perspectives on key topics uh, that look at the intersection of a class, race, and global interpretation uh, from the beginning, right? We don't, we don't make that the last question in the discussion. We make that the first framing, uh, looking at these things together. Uh, so for example, uh, we had two panels on the 20th anniversary of the Global War on Terror, uh, which you can find archived online uh, uh, at eCornell with a class race global framing. And now we're looking at popular politics uh, from a class race global framing, uh, trying to be intersectional across these lines in addition to gender, in addition to uh, political ideology and other dimensions, and also international in perspective, right? Thinking about different countries and different regions uh, in comparison and connection to each other. And I think today's topic is really exciting. Uh, and our panel is gonna be able to do that, both that deep perspective on the intersections of class, race, and global from a critical and, and historical perspective, but also very timely about a contemporary issue, right? Uh, as we now are looking at really important elections, right? Many of us have followed elections around the world, uh, elections in Chile where a left of center party prevailed very recently in Colombia. And now much of the world is looking towards elections in Brazil and in the United States in October and November. And of course, each of these countries has very specific conditions. Uh, we can't make simplistic comparisons, but there are deeper resonances that are happening. And I just wanna sketch a couple of things uh, that we can look at. You know, we had a certain narrative uh, coming out of the end of the Cold War, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the fall of apartheid in South Africa, and a notion that sort of polarized fights between left and right, between colonialism and liberation movements were sort of settled to a certain extent by the 1990s. Uh, one way that people talked about this was a sort of end of history, the idea that a certain kind of middle of the road managed capitalism would spread and prevail everywhere with some hiccups. Um, and this was represented by you know, Bill Clinton, Tony Blair, that particular era. But what we've seen since then is a series of crises. Uh, the post 9-11 global war on terror, which involved dozens of countries from every region of the world. The post 2007 recession in a series of economic crises since then. The political legitimacy and uprisings in the Middle East and Africa from 2011 onwards. And a host of challenges to the legitimacy of a sort of political order, a challenge to police and carceral and prison uh, systems in the US and elsewhere in the world uh, from sort of left of center and anti-racist perspectives, as well as challenges from the far right, uh, whether it be in Brazil uh, uh, or the United States to a sort of multiracial democratic order. And so we have these new ideas of popular politics uh, that have been characterized in ways that can get really messy and can get really confusing, right? We've heard about far right politicians like Bolsonaro in Brazil, like Trump and DeSantis in the United States as being populists, as speaking to some deeper well of public sentiment and challenging some kind of elite, often articulated as a cultural elite, sort of know-it-alls, do-gooders, 
that run society, that need to be challenged by the real people. Uh, uh, and that resonates in other regions of the world too. We also have new politics of the left, uh, from Lula in Brazil, to Bernie Sanders, Cori Bush, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in the United States, as well as popular social movements, working class movements, anti-racist movements in Brazil, the US and elsewhere, that also claim a true popular base to be challenging a sort of elite centrist politics, a sort of that, that vision and offering a truer representation, a deeper democratic representation of working class people, of a universal working class, uh, also in response to social movements, challenging an economic elite of wealthy business owners, investors, and managers. And this can get really messy, right? This can get really messy. And I think our panel would agree that terms like populism, terms like class, race, uh, they have some material objective usefulness, but they're also very subjective. They're also very slippery. They can be mobilized in ways um, that we like and don't like, in ways that are meaningful, in ways that are deceptive, uh, whether by people on the right or center, or even in messy ways uh, by people uh, on the liberal or left too. So that's some of what we wanna get at. And in today's discussion, we're gonna have some really great panelists that I'm gonna um, briefly introduce, and they are gonna speak based on their own research, their own expertise, um, you know, that might be in a specific country or a couple of regions. Uh, and then as the conversation moves along over the course of the hour, uh, we're going to try to find some points of connection. And so we welcome you all, uh, if you have questions, uh, to bring them into this conversation. Um, and, and we will try to, to, to bring them into the discussion. And we'll also find these points of resonance uh, with each other. Uh, I'm going to now introduce uh, our wonderful panelists. Uh, we have, there's five of us. Uh, first up, we have Dave Rodiger. Uh, Dave Rodiger it teaches history and American studies at the University of Kansas. And he's the author of many books, including Seizing Freedom, The Wages of Whiteness, and How Race Survived US History. And Dave has been a leading scholar a leading thinker on exactly these questions, right? How class and race have not only been important in US history and in other places too, in a global perspective, uh, but also how we can only understand them in relation to each other and everyday lived realities of class and race and their deep politics, their deeper structures that shape our lives. And so Dave's most recent book, uh, which actually uh, it is having its second edition released uh, today, uh, is The Sinking Middle Class. And it gets at exactly these questions of how we talk about economic identity. And you can find The Sinking Middle Class at haymarketbooks.org or wherever it is uh, you like to get books. And this is Dave's latest intervention, um, which is part of a larger corpus, which has been incredibly influential on precisely these questions. We also have Louis Raymer, uh, who teaches anthropology at Vassar College. And he's also writing a book about race, class, and populism, uh, tentatively titled Strategic Ambiguities, looking at language and media in politics, especially in the Caribbean uh, and Caribbean uh, radio and media, especially. And he's looking at the way language and media of class and race and populism are mobilized uh, in formal politics as well as in social movements in the Caribbean. And he has a perspective on, on other regions as well. Next up, we have Mary Hicks, who teaches history at University of Chicago. Uh, Mary, like Dave, has that long perspective, that multi-century perspective uh, of research uh, that of course can be brought to bear on specific contexts. Uh, she's a historian of the Black Atlantic who looks at race, slavery, capitalism, and migration uh, in global perspective. And she's writing a book uh, about Black mariners uh, and the world of South Atlantic slavery that looks at the, the realm of Portuguese expansion uh, globally from the perspective of enslaved and freed Black seafaring laborers. Uh, and especially at some of these, these global connections, especially between West Africa and Brazil, sort of top down, bottom up uh, together. 
We also have Wendy Muse, who is also interested in the connections between Africa and Brazil. Uh, Wendy is completing a dissertation in history at New York University. And Wendy studies 20th century networks, political networks, uh, also in the Portuguese realm uh, and ties between the African continent uh, and Brazil. Uh, and she's also animated and engaged with 21st century politics in Brazil, uh, having built ties in Brazil with Black women's political movements uh, and, and other things going on down there. And an important project that Wendy's working on is the Left Pocket Project podcast, uh, which is a podcast which focuses on the histories of leftists of color, um, highlighting different stories and sort of bringing forward different voices um, to sort of build a larger, a larger archive and a larger fresh story for our generation of the histories of leftists of color. And you can check that out on patreon.com slash leftpoc. Uh, or, or other wherever you get your, your podcast. Finally, I'm Tej Nagaraja. I'm a historian at Cornell University based in the ILR school. And I try to do class race global in my scholarship uh, and in my teaching. I'm writing a book about World War II that looks at soldiers in World War II and their labor and class struggles, their race struggles against Jim Crow and criminal justice violence, and their global visions of anti-fascism and anti-colonialism as well on a global stage. So um, to, my, to my writing and my teaching, I'm really interested in those intersections where there's meaningful and animated commitments between people concerned with economic justice, with racial justice and global justice. And um, when you get deeper into some of these uh, stories, you find that um, these are not abstract connections. They're often very deep and lived um, connections. Um, so I'm really excited to get into this discussion. I wanna go first to Dave. Um, and Dave, uh, tell us something about your work uh, and, and how you bring to bear on these questions of race, class, and populism and you know, as they, they might speak indirectly or even directly to popular politics uh, for our times in the 2020s. Thank you, Ted, uh, and thanks for all your work putting this together. Um, and uh, uh, likewise to Chris and to Nicholas for, for working on it. I'm very, uh, it's great to be around such exciting young intellectuals uh, and I look forward to the discussion a lot. Um, I want to first of all register a little bit of a reservation, or at least just to say that our topic today is, I think, mostly going to be electoral politics. Uh, I don't think, and I'm going to adhere to that emphasis, I don't think that the electoral emphasis uh, gets us to either a strong analysis of um, where resistance movements are or of where they need to go and what they need to imagine. Uh, but it certainly is an important component and context for how we reach some of those uh, decisions. So I'm going to be drawing in the first few minutes here uh, about my work uh, from sinking middle class uh, broadly. And, um, in, and I'm going to go back 50 years. I'm a historian, so you're stuck with going back first 50 years and then 30 years. I'm going to try to provide a couple of frames for how the United States uh, ends with such impoverished politics. Now, when I say that, I'm not implying that before 50 years ago, there was any kind of a golden age that we should look back to in terms of, of US politics, but rather that there was a different set of ground rules and uh, contradictions that governed uh, that earlier uh, period. So it was about 50 years ago that austerity and, and uh, neoliberalism uh, were agreed upon by broad sections of capital uh, and that uh, the rulers of the United States decided that we couldn't have guns and butter together, we couldn't have butter at all, uh, and we would only have a new and certain kind of, of um, techniques and guns for, for violence. Um, so that we began to see the emergence of what Ruthie Gilmore has wonderfully called the anti-state state. That is a state that wasn't actually all that austere, but was devote, devoted to spending on repression and incarceration uh, 
an empire and a kind of a targeted tech um, driven empire. Now, not too surprisingly, the Republicans were a lot better at this than the Democrats were. Uh, I grew up around Republicans in a very Republican Southern Illinois area in which people thought they were Republicans because the Republicans would balance their checkbooks just like my neighbors said, we have to balance our own uh, checkbooks. Well, it didn't turn out that anything like that uh, emerged, but the Republicans uh, around race and racism and around austerity had a more uh, consistent rap and therefore they won very uh, regularly uh, in the years after this change of ruling class uh, policy. So there's only one Democrat Carter between the Nixon election in 68 and the Clinton election in, in 92. And this uh, rise of the so-called Reagan Democrat, the defection of New Dealers, uh, once the, there wasn't much more that could be said for the welfare state in terms of policy and uh, expansion, uh, this uh, rise of the Reagan Democrat provoked a crisis, desperation, eventually in the ranks of the Democratic Party. And so it's in the uh, mid 1980s that the Democratic establishment in Michigan, the UAW and the uh, state Democratic Party send Stanley Greenberg, a young political scientist uh, from Yale, to just denied tenure at Yale reinventing himself as a democratic operative, but a Marxist in the South African context. They send him to Macomb County, Michigan, Collar County of Detroit, very white, very working class, had been very democratic, but became a Wallace voting, Nixon voting, and eventually Reagan voting uh, county to try to figure out the Reagan Democrat. Now, given the larger context, uh, Greenberg didn't, and the Democrats didn't have anything to offer these working class people in Macomb County on, a cl on class terms. In fact, they were supporting NAFTA and they were uh, not forwarding uh, trade union power as a possibility. So what Greenberg does is he uh, goes to Macomb County and listens. And he says, I'm going to listen to you, white workers, all white focus groups, often all male focus groups, all Reagan voter focus groups. And he says, tell me everything you think about what's wrong with the United States. And so he hears and reports all of these things that reflect racism and reflect uh, anti-abortion politics. And he says, this is what we have to get next to. And if we're gonna beat the Reagans of the world, this is what politics has to be. And he decides to call that politics in a book that reflects on Clinton's victory, he becomes the strategist for Clinton. You see, he reflects on the 92 victory in a, in a book called Middle Class Dreams. And this idea, I think, that the essence of politics is to appeal to the middle class and to appeal to a middle class that's uh, uh, implicitly white and to appeal to that white middle class in its worst encounter group white moments that he produced in these focus groups becomes kind of the game of politics in the last 30 years now. The one other thing that I'll say uh, before signing off is this also uh, has world implications because the United States uh, tries then to further its own hegemony by being the nation that has figured out how to have a broad middle class, which is very, very uh, doubtful that it has uh, figured that out. But we hear a lot both about uh, how the United States can lead to a middle-class world, a middle-class India, uh, uh, a middle-class global South. Uh, and also now Biden talks about having a middle-class foreign policy for the United States. So all of this has tremendous transnational implications as well. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks so much uh, for that, Dave. Um, and uh, uh, just, to, just to respond to Dave and to all the other panelists, uh, you are you are not required to only speak about electoral politics. You are allowed to speak uh, about non-electoral politics and movements as well. So um, let that let that let that be clear. But the framing is certainly uh, uh, you know the the political um, the formal political realm. Uh, I, I will just do one quick housekeeping note. Uh, I wanted to make sure everybody knows this event is being recorded uh, and it will be uh, archived uh, at the same URL that you're tuning into. And so you can share it with other people there.
And uh, viewers who want to submit a question, you can do it in the chat uh, by clicking the dialog box at the top right of your video player. Um, thanks so much uh, for that, Dave. I want to turn uh, turn next to Mary um, and and tell us something about your work and sort of how you see it um, uh, contributing to uh, our, our sort of broader perspective on on these bigger questions. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be in conversation with these scholars. So, so I really liked this point of departure that Dave brought up, which is that most of politics that's occurring is not electoral politics. And that's very much the direction I come uh, at this conversation from, because the, the era that I uh, research, uh, the 18th and early 19th century, um, this is before electoral politics is really dominant um, in a place like Brazil, um, which is the site of my research. Um, and it's also a time in which um, people of African descent are not part of formal political processes at all um, because they are enslaved. And so I think it if we're thinking about these um, issues in the sort of long durée sense, we need to realize that most people are operating outside of the realm of formal politics um, for most of the early modern and modern period. Um, and that should be our point of departure. So a few things about my work and then a, a few notes about, I think, what's happening in Latin America right now, or you know, from my perspective, um, which is a, a focus on race. Um, so the first thing is that my book is about um, maritime labor in the early modern period. And one of the foundational arguments I make in my book is that you can't have a Portuguese empire without black labor, um, especially black maritime labor, because uh, enslaved and free men of African descent make up at least 40% and sometimes more of uh, sailing vessels during this period. Um, and that they have an incredible amount of uh, influence on legal, cultural, commercial, and also intellectual currents that are happening in the early modern uh, maritime world. Um, and so my book itself does not explore class consciousness. I'm actually looking at a time period in which um, these men, these laborers, these racialized laborers and enslaved laborers oftentimes don't see themselves in terms of class solidarities. Um, they oftentimes identify with um, patronage networks. So that means that you, you the goal uh, of what you're doing is to, in fact, insert yourself into a patronage network with the expectation that someday, if you're lucky and you work hard enough, you'll be the patron, right? And you'll have clients. So it's not a horizontal set of political relationships. It's really a vertical set of uh, political relationships. Um, and because of this, um, they don't, exercise politics in the way that we imagine that laboring classes do. Um, and so the second thing is that there is a, a kind of burgeoning sense of racial solidarity, even in the late um, 18th century. Um, one of the chapters of my book looks at how um, mariners of African descent utilized a free soil law um, that was adopted by the Portuguese empire in 1761. Uh, to lobby for freedom. So basically, if you set foot on Portuguese soil and you're enslaved, you can become free. Um, but this is only really realized through legal petitioning. And so they create alliances with free Black brothers, um, Catholic brothers in the city of Lisbon in order to petition the Portuguese state to free them. Um, and so you have um, this kind of cross status, but intra-racial set of solidarities that emerge around these legal struggles that um, are really, you know, they foment for, for the next 50 years um, until um, Brazilian independence and then even after in 1822. And so this is one example, I think, of, of the kind of politics that people who are excluded from formal political processes can engage in. Uh, they can mobilize around issues of legal activism. They can create ephemeral networks of solidarity and information sharing. Um, and so I think that there are a couple of kind of parallels to today. Um, I was looking at the election in Colombia, um, and I think it's an interesting moment to think about the ways in which social movements become institutionalized in Latin America. Um, so for instance, um, Gustavo Petro, who is now the president-elect of Colombia, is a long-term politician. Uh, he was the mayor of Bogota. Um, but Francia Marquez, his running mate um, and, and vice president-elect, actually comes from an activist space. 
right? She was an environmental activist. She's an Afro-Colombian working class woman originally. Uh, she became an environmental lawyer. Um, she was part of the peace process um, that was initiated in um, 2016. Um, and it, it's really her positioning as a feminist, as an anti-racist um, who, you know, articulates that she's speaking to Afro-Colombian and also indigenous Colombian populations that enabled Petro to really put together a viable coalition to, to receive over 50% of the vote. Um, and so I'm sure we'll get into this um, today, but I think the PT is looking to do something similar. Uh, even though I think in Latin America, you have um, kind of diverging political imperatives among the left. Some leftist movements are, are trying to create coalitions with, um, you know, uh, center leftists and leftists, and others are sort of swinging to the center. And so there's some interesting things happening in Brazil right now. Um, the PET uh, is just on the verge of releasing their platform um, for this coming election in October, uh, in which they walk back some commitments to labor legislation to overturn um, some very unpopular legislation um, that was adopted in 2017 by Temer, who's the former president. Um, but they're also redoubling on their commitments to racial justice, um, to green policy, um, and to um, bolstering programs, really popular programs like the Bolsa Familia, which is all, the largest welfare program in the world. Um, so they're sort of pivoting a little bit to, to the center, perhaps, um, but they're certainly going to be receiving pushback from that, I think. And so that's where you, I think you see um, this you know, uh, interesting intersection between movement politics um, that's still ongoing um, in places like Brazil, and then also um, formal electoral politics. So I hope we, we get into this more in our discussion. Great. Thank you so much uh, for that, that Mary. Uh, let's turn to, to Louis. Uh, what do you want to uh, bring to the table, um, you know, from your own work and just uh, sketch it for us, uh, uh, your own research and writing and, and how you feel like it speaks to these bigger questions? Thank you for that question and thank you all for having me and it's a great honor to be in this conversation with you all. Um, so my work actually also um, sits in a kind of liminal zone between formalized political institutions, electoral politics, and social movements, since my work has centered around the production and consumption of talk radio, and specifically the Dutch Caribbean. Yeah, and so there's these talk radio programs, and they're about these are islands: Aruba, Curacao, Bonaire. My fieldwork was mostly. I'm an anthropologist. Fieldwork mostly focused in Curacao during the 2010s. And so certainly, these talk radio programs are sites where uh, where uh, people comment on electoral politics, where political parties and um, politicians, individual politicians will turn to in order to try to amass support, but also are places where broader political narratives are being constructed by the regular listeners. Like there's its own scene, if you will, of, of different kinds of activists and pundits and so on, who are basically constructing political narratives that then actually end up shaping, constraining sometimes even the kinds of things that then that formal politic, polit politicians can, can do or can persuade people of right so um so it's a side that 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 um plays an important role in setting the tone of like what what even gets to be imagined as politically possible at any given moment in time um specifically around um the 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 corner of the caribbean where i work there is a kind of intersection between europe and south american politics, because these are European overseas territories, but are right next to Colombia and Venezuela, and those are affected by the dynamics there. Um, and if there's one thing that I can take that I want to really emphasize about my, my work in, in this space is just how much um, none of these categories can really be taken for granted. So um, what race and what class even mean, right? What they refer to, 
um, is not something that um, any kind of political movement at this moment in time should take for granted. And it's certainly not something that I, as an empirical researcher, could, could have taken for granted because what I noticed from the talk radio programs in Curacao is that actually the, the, um, the part of the political struggle that was being waged and, and political struggle, not just in terms of electoral politics, but between different kinds of activists or pundits and so on, was waged over the meaning of these categories themselves. Like what is race? What does class actually refer to? Is it about like a lifestyle? Is it about how you speak? Is it about what kind of clothes you wear, where you shop? Or is it about right um, your profession and your membership uh with a trade union so those so there were there's a struggle there was a struggle that i found between materialist and cultural understandings of class so that's one thing and also race right um between race as something that has to do with um issues of um identifying elements of the the, the colonial past or the afterlives of slavery or is it about um, certain kinds of material inequities in the present, right? That um, that uh, that distinguish Afro descendants specifically in 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 the Dutch Antilles from other people. So that was those were the struggles that were happening. And so I think a really important point here is to never um, really take that for granted. How people understand those categories also means. Um, it's also a struggle about how people imagine their cool their 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 interests and how people imagine and understand who are their potential allies right um depending on how one understands what class is or what race is that can change then what kinds of alliances become imaginable and possible but also how people understand their interests so it's not such an easy thing like well if we're going to just talk in this particular way then we're going to be able to appeal to people because of their class because they might have a completely different understanding than you so i've often seen electoral politics uh, um, in 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 this space fail because people just politicians aren't really in touch with some of these competing narratives about what class and what race are, how they are understood, and thus fail to um, be effective. All right, so um, the other thing is that populism as a frame, right? And because my, 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 my talk radio site is so shaped by language and how people frame things, um, one of the things that I've, I've really taken away is just how much populism as a frame can really um, take over every kind of discussion and reframe things in very unusual ways. So one of the ways, and sometimes uncomfortable ways, so one of the um, particular ways that I saw this happen is around the politics of decolonization. So because Curacao is still a non-sovereign territory, part of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, this question of should Curacao become independent or not um, resurfaces ever so often. And, and it certainly did when I was doing my fieldwork in 2010. Um, the island had just changed its political status um, to that of autonomous country. You know, I call it Colony 2.0. <laughs> We're always like updating our our software, but like the basic basic arrangements haven't really been challenged. Um, okay, so um, what has happened through populism, uh, through this whole rhetoric of there's an establishment, there's an elite, and there's a real people over there, and their concerns are being ignored by this establishment, however defined, is that the debate around decolonization has become scrambled through this lens and has become one where um, it is the elite, the out of touch intellectuals and elites who are in favor of independence and the real people want to remain part of the kingdom of the Netherlands with all the benefits of the Dutch <laughs> um, ideas around um, uh, 
social democracy and the welfare state or and what have you. So, and debates around integrating further within the EU have also been um, similarly refracted, right? So it's like, if you're in touch with the real people, you're in favor of EU integration. So that, that I think it, 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 it shows just how, how uh, populist, just as a rhetoric, populism, just a rhetorical frame can lead to um, uncomfortable results for some folks on the left. Thanks so much, uh, Louis. And that's that's uh, really interesting because some of the frameworks you bring in, it brings in uh, sort of the Caribbean, approximate to South America, and also ties to Europe. So it's sort of a, a space that, that brings together a few regions. Uh, let's turn to, to Wendy. What do you want to bring to the table uh, from, from your work uh, and, and how it can speak to, to some of these bigger questions? Sure. Um, and thank you so much for having me and muitos abraços for all the Brazilian watchers and listeners um, now and going forward. Um, obviously, I work on Brazil um, and my work also relates to Portuguese speaking Africa, so former Portuguese colonies, particularly Angola and Mozambique, um, and the intersections and networks that are formed um, between everyday Brazilians. It's a multiracial group of people that I'm looking at, but primarily uh, people of African descent living in Brazil um, and the leftist, primarily leftist networks that they form with people in these Portuguese African countries in the process of decolonization and following that. Um, and what's interesting is the time period that I'm looking at during the Cold War, Brazil is undergoing a, a military dictatorship. And while we often, you know, bookend it, the formal dates are 1964 to 1985, there's a lot going on in the lead up to that, which is pretty fascinating when you're thinking about things that are going on now in Brazil and things that are going on as well in the United States and other parts of the world. Um, but that's that's the time period that I'm looking at. And what's fascinating is, as I said, they're going through a military dictatorship in Brazil, while at the same time trying to overthrow the Portuguese in um, these African countries, as well as trying to subsequently form their own countries, thinking of you know, new political frameworks. How do you live in a post-colonial society, right? What does governance look like? And so the idea of populism is very important, obviously, to my work. Uh, but more particularly, I'm, I'm interested in thinking about Again, how ev actual everyday people are dealing with these larger questions of politics, larger questions of national identity, larger questions of how race and class overlap and intersect, um, particularly because so many of the people in my research are people of lower, lower class economic means, um, people who have no formal connection to the state, um, and people in some cases, especially in, in the African situation, or Southern African situation in particular, people who are villagers, people who are peasants, um, who are forming these major political networks for the first times of, in their lives um, and engaging in politics in, in a rather um, urgent sort of way, right? Um, and so the notes that they sort of trade in the process is very interesting to me as a researcher, um, but also kind of thinking about why Africa in particular becomes this heightened political space for people in Brazil and the Afro-diasporic um, idea as a whole, right? People in the past had gone to typically Cuba or the USSR or the United States or even Portugal when they thought about the Cold War, when they thought about changes in politics within Brazil. But these are people who are looking instead to Africa and not in the sense that we often are taught or even discussed with regard to, to slavery, right? These connections between Brazil and, and Africa, West or Southern um, with regard to the slave period, right? But thinking about modern day um, iterations of what Africa means to the average Brazilian um, and particularly Brazilian of, 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 of color or of African descent. But furthermore, uh, my work explores sort of what that does to the Brazilian left, right? We have discussions sometimes about how the Brazilian left helped helped uh, parts of Southern Africa, how they helped in the decolonial process. Um, but at the same time, we don't talk quite as much about the influence that actual African people had at the time on the politics going on in Brazil and on the struggle against authoritarianism that's happening in the Brazilian state. Um, so that's what my work is on. But I see lots of overlaps, even in terms of my own personal experiences, because doing research at the time that I have been um, under what some would consider, uh, you know, a, I would consider a fascist regime, but certainly some have called a proto-fascist regime um, under Bolsonaro. And even in the lead up to that, um, during the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff, um, during the ouster of, of her candidacy, but then also the sort of um, 
upending of Lula's presidential campaign in 2018. So really seeing some political machinations that are scary and very reminiscent um, to the time period that I'm studying, all the way down to the censorship, the police state, and fill in the blank other authoritarian means to sort of keep people down. Um, so that to me has been really fascinating and I'm, I'm really looking forward to our discussion and in particular how we center the activism and engagement of, of people who perhaps are overlooked in our discussions often about politics and what that means uh, going forward in Latin America and around the world. Thanks. Thanks so much for that, Wendy. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's been really uh, fantastic um, to really kind of sit with this perspective. Um, you know, we increasingly have a discussion uh, using a framework of racial capitalism, a framework of global capitalism, to try to think about how we can look at any context, right? Any any country or region across decades and centuries and, and our own times, right? And um, we've seen in popular movements, uh, and, and Wendy has talked about some of the popular movements of the 20th century and 21st century, where there is a real uh, sense, even among uh, you know, people that that don't uh, don't have um, the the ability to travel, perhaps, or to travel around the world, who see their politics in global terms, in in the context of global struggles, um, and and we see some of that. And so, people that are watching this and and are trying to read some of this work um, can think about these discussions about racial capitalism, about global capitalism, and how we can conceive of these things um, from the early emergence of capitalism uh, in the time that uh, Mary uh, Hicks is talking about in her work through, you know, uh, work that Dave has written about in the 19th and 20th century with the sort of interactions of Native Americans, Black people in the era of slavery and into the era of emancipation and waves of immigration, diverse cross-class immigration from Europe and elsewhere through the era of the Cold War uh, that Wendy is talking about and decolonization and more recent, recent eras. Um, and so I want to move to, I want to read a couple of comments um, that sort of speak to uh, uh, the question, and then I'll, I'll I'll ask another round of questions that really ask you all to speak squarely to contemporary political struggles. Uh, Javier Bravo says, history repeats. What are the opportunities for remedies? Stella says, you know, let's talk about the parallels today. Mary has addressed how marginalized groups uh, navigated history and politics and society. How do we change the narrative and move forward? Um, so those are just a couple of questions to sort of put into the ether. But I'm going to ask for a go around. I want to hear from everybody now uh, about politics today, politics in the 2010s and 2020s. Um, you've all laid out some of the reference points, um, you know, for the United States. Dave has talked about sort of the 1990s uh, moment, the 80s and 90s moment. And, and, and I'll ask him to speak more about the, the contemporary era. Uh, and we've had references now to Colombia, to Brazil, to Chile. Um, and one thing that you know, I wanna do in these conversations and in this series of events um, is to think about the US in the world, right? Uh, you know, Dave talked about the imperious role of the US in the world, uh, both sort of projecting the US state, both projecting sort of a, a more punitive carceral approach to its domestic populations and 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 globally uh but also to think the us of the world right and and the us of the americas as well right and we all know that the united states um is not uh only exceptional or singular in relation to the americas but it also shares a history a history uh of native american peoples uh of, of black people who endured slavery and its subsequent regimes of European migrations of different kinds, of non-European migrations of different kinds since then, of migration within the Americas in the 20th, 21st century. So one of the reasons to have this panel uh, is to not only view uh, the US as a country that has a foreign policy uh, to Latin America, which we should definitely talk about, but also as a, as a, as a place animated by its own race and class struggles, parallel struggles, shaped by these parallel histories uh, of dispossession, uh, of dishonor, uh, and also of social struggle. So I'm going to ask us to go around. Uh, maybe maybe we can start with Mary this time. Uh, 
And uh, you want to say more about the contemporary political scene. We have these reference points on the table of recent elections in Chile and Colombia, upcoming elections in Brazil and the United States. And you gestured at some of these dynamics between economic policy, uh, sort of uh, appeals to sort of ma material class interests, uh, as well as other social movements, feminist movements, uh, racial uh, justice and indigenous justice movements. So do you want to say something and you can reference one country, you can reference more than one country. Uh, it's up to you about what are those dynamics uh, that we can observe politics, both electoral politics and social movement politics in our times. Yeah, so I think it's a really interesting question. Um, when I was preparing for this, I was sort of pondering what's unique, where does Latin America diverge from US? Um, and I think that we're actually in a moment of convergence between Latin American and US politics in a sense, because you know, the Cold War played out differently in Latin America. There's basically not a liberal consensus, right, in Latin America that is, is you know, pressuring the extremes of American politics towards the center. And so you have operational communists and socialist parties still surviving, and then you also have pretty much avowed authoritarians, which, you know, Wendy alluded to earlier, Bolsonaro being one of them, but also there are many others. And so you already have this polarization um, through 20th century Latin American political history that now I think Americans are becoming aware, oh, yes, there are actually a range from socialists probably communists, maybe like 10, but like from socialist into authoritarian fascists in the United States as well. And so I think that um, one of the things that we can do as observers in the United States, even though I know we're, we're speaking to an international audience, is actually learn from how social movements and, and political parties have operated in this much more ideologically complicated space um, than Americans are, ourselves tend to acknowledge. Um, so I think a couple things uh, that are interesting to me about contemporary politics uh, in Latin America right now is that you have a number of um, sort of center left and leftist parties trying to marry uh, I guess is what's termed social justice or you know uh, racial justice in the United States with um, economic justice um, and remedies to inequality. So for instance, in Colombia, the platform uh, of Petro included things like universal college, free college, um, but also very clearly um, saying that, you know, indigenous and Afro-Colombian populations who had felt marginalized by the political process would be, would have a voice in his, his administration. And I think that, um, you know, Marquez helped him make that case. And he actually got a very high turnout among, um, you know, regions that are, that are sort of dominated by an, an Afro-Colombian population. You know, the PT, which is, um, you know, after sort of being, being on the outs because of a, a number of issues from mismanagement, um, corruption, et cetera, but also, um, you know, sort of the legal processes around anti-corruption um, that were dominated by conservatives, um, has now sought to revive itself with the candidacy of Lula. Um, and he, again, is, is, is trying to marry, I think, um, you know, material, uh, you know, claims and policies with um, with racial justice uh, claims and policies. And the first time he was elected uh, in 2002, he won a majority of the Afro-Brazilian population, right? And so he's always been coded as a kind of, um, in a way, almost black figure because of his working class roots, because he rose through um, the union movement in Sao Paulo. Um, uh, he was uh, president, head of a, a metal workers union, um, and it was through a series of uh, wildcat strikes at the end of the 1970s that he sort of rose to national prominence. Um, so because of his class background and because his family is from the Northeast, which is a hev heavily Afro-Brazilian part of the country, he's always been sort of coded as uh, a friend of Afro-Brazilians, even though there have been many rightful critiques of, of, of the limits of, of PT's polit policies towards Afro-Brazilians. Um, and so I think that um, you're seeing experimentation about trying to marry these two things. 
Um, and, you know, I guess it, we'll see how it plays out. I mean, Chile is an interesting case of this. The feminist movement um, and feminist organizing was really important to the election of Boric, but, um, you know, now his his sort of approval ratings are, are underwater again, and he's running into very thorny issues uh, in terms of the kind of um, uh, uh, legislator he's working with. Um, so it's not to say that these will ultimately be successful enough to achieve structural change. Um, in these places, but they are, they do seem to be viable ways to win elections, at least in some places. Great, thanks so much for that, Mary. And so we have reference points there in Brazil, in Chile, in Colombia. Um, and now I want to, uh, Wendy, you want to jump jump back in now and, and, and you touched on it a little bit, but you want to speak more uh, about how you see sort of contemporary contemporary political struggles, electoral struggles, movement struggles uh, in this frame, building on that? Sure. Um, I just wanted to add to that. I, I think it's interesting that we're talking about populism when I think in many cases in Latin America, when we talk about populism towards a right wing uh, direction, we're looking at foreign intervention, right? We're looking at U.S. meddling, European meddling. We're looking at um, foreign press having a major involvement in terms of swaying the population. We're looking at movements like Florida Dilma, um, Get Out Dilma, basically, um, that were led in large part and financed by U.S.-based, uh, you know, think tanks. And so we, I think we have to be careful sometimes when we talk about populism, at least on the right, uh, without understanding that there's a lot of stuff going on in the background there. But even on, in terms of what is the non left, right, in Latin America, there's also meddling by way of certain foundations, certain NGOs, and the limitations that they also place on the population. Um, some of the research that I've done on Southern Africa, you see in particular U.S.-based foundations literally clamping down on or attempting to clamp down on uh, too far left uh, movement building, right, um, in the interest of some other uh, objectives. So I think we have to we have to also be careful and not to say that these people don't have autonomy, that these people are not free thinking or something, but just to understand that how understand that populism as we know it and as we refer to it is also shaped by all these other outside factors um, that that kind of change the way um, people people operate. And that goes for the United States as well, right? So I'm not just saying this is exclusive to, to Latin America. Um, but what I do think is, is important is that when we talk about political movements, as, as David referred to earlier, we have to make sure that we're not missing things by virtue of sort of closing down our discussion to or limiting it solely to electoral politics. What you see throughout Latin America, as we've hinted at already, is a large movement of um, Afro descendants, people of indigenous descent, around these sort of questions of race and representation through the, the college system, through the school system in general, and through labor. Um, despite the fact that these populations are predominantly of color, if we want to use that term, um, a lot of the leadership, politically or otherwise, is still often in the hands of upper to upper middle class white men. Um, and while some of those people are well, you know, not to say that they're all like poorly intentioned or something, um, but some of those, some of what we miss when we talk only about the electoral realm or only about formal political organizations is that we miss, for example, the unions that are being formed by domestic workers, predominantly women of color throughout Latin America. We miss, for example, the indigenous movements that are pushing for education in schools about indigenous um, histories throughout Latin America, or for example, all of the the, the groups that formed um, to push for African history throughout Brazil and other parts of Latin America. Argentina also comes to mind for this. Um, so I think what we, and also I think what we sometimes miss is if we silo these movements as well beyond electoral politics into something that's just about class or that's just about race. Um, and in fact, what we're seeing is an overlap or an engagement of multiple things at once, in particular, really, in particular, recognizing that the grand majority of the population that's poor throughout the Americas is going to repeatedly be um, and has been historically people of African and indigenous descent. So I think in some ways, while um, as Mary hinted as well, as, as Lula and the, the Workers' Party is trying to kind of meld these two things together, they need to be careful that they're not, um, or is my opinion, they, they have to be careful that they're not throwing out um, their larger voter voter body, the predominant um, indigenous and, and black voter body that put them in office and that has kept them in office despite all of these challenges in the process of solely favoring um, what is 
kind of shaking out to be somewhat of, um, I don't want to use the term neoliberal, but a slightly more right-pulling politics by virtue of some of the people who they've been um, bringing on as their vice presidential candidates or as their advisors. And so I just hope that going forward, because we've already seen this kind of happening in Chile, kind of happening in, in Argentina as well, that people continue to stay close to their roots and take into account what their constituents actually need and again, that goes for the U.S. as well. And we know very well, I think, the way that um, the Democrats have had trouble um, really defending the populations that put them there. Thanks for that, Wendy. Yeah, and I mean, I think that last point is especially, um, you know, really hits home uh, as we sort of think about a few of these different contexts. Um, Louis, you want to jump in on this? You can you can speak to any country or more than one country that you want to talk about. Um, I think uh, uh, there are some trends that uh, I've been thinking about recently, which uh, all converge around this notion of um, co-optation, right? So um, one of the things that I've observed, particularly in Curacao and its relationship to the Netherlands, is the way that particular kinds of critiques that are first um, that are first cooked up by activists and um, by people in the labor movement that, uh, against corruption, for example, against the hold of certain kinds of business elites. They're basically the kinds of conversations that in the in the U.S. is usually glossed by the notion of a um, professional managerial class, um, how those ended up being co-opted actually in the service of promoting and successfully promoting and packaging another round of austerity measures. Um, so, and this, this, this round of austerity measures, this was in 2020, um, was billed as like a way to crack down on the and by the way the professional manager class in Curiosa had been racialized in this iteration as the black jet set cracking down on these like black upwardly mobile man and middle managers who are you know making way too much money regulating too much and mucking up the economy etc cetera, etc cetera. so it it was a very clever way that the conservative um, uh, element of of politics there was able to co-opt this this kinds of this kind of um, discourse and and turn it in its favor um, and and capture some of that energy right that was first directed at a, a different kind of business at, at a business elite. It was actually part of the business elite that then supported these austerity measures. Then turn this into a discourse that actually about um, middle managers and um, people in upper managerial positions in government, right? So that was a very interesting moment. Um, this ties to also what I've noticed in Colombia, which is where we we see that Uribismo, which is the which is was the more or less the general consensus in Colombia for the past, I don't know, decade or so. Um, and indeed, I, I, I want to second the point we made earlier about how um, indeed in, in South and Central America and Caribbean ideological messiness and heterogeneity is definitely a fact of life um, in ways that probably people in the US might have to get used to. Um, but anyway, it's Uribismo, which was the centrist consensus in Colombia, which had its kind of liberal components, but also some authoritarian and even violent <laughs> paramilitary elements to it, um, collapsed, yeah? So imagine that's like, pro-democracy, this coalition of like pro-democracy liberals and then some parallel militaries over there that are part of the coalition but but disavowed. Anyway, so the anyways that that coalition is 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 completely broken. And in fact the, the two contenders in this in the race recently were were both positioning themselves as being against the Uribista establishment. And 
what was really interesting, and I'm speculating a little bit here based on my own work in Curious, I was like, it made, it made me ask the question whether the whether the opponent to um, Petro was, in fact, maybe an attempt for of some of that Uribista element to try to rebrand itself, right, through a kind of counter-establishment framing and, and rhetoric and positioning. Um, and so, you know, one of my cautious optimism slash pessimism about the moment um in certainly in in um in also in uh, for chile and and other places to 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 think about the ways that you know the conservative or even further right elements are going to be able to respond another thing on the, on the social justice aspect one of the things that i've observed also in the dutch antillian context is how um the rhetoric around the afterlives of slavery and the reckoning uh, around that can be co-opted in very, very anti-Black and toxic ways. So that talking about the afterlife of slavery or invoking it becomes part of arguments for uh, cultural pathologies, right? Or um, explanations for criminality and or deviance of, um, of Afro Curacao's and Afro Dutch people, and more generally saying that, well, it's because they were slaves. That's why they have a propensity for violence. And, um, you know, it's kind of Moynihan remix. <laughs> We've had some of these arguments in the US as well about matrifocal households as a legacy of slavery. So, in many ways, we're seeing, I've been seeing return of this kind of response, right? And, and actually, taking this moment of racial reckoning and saying and using and folding that back into an argument um for uh bringing things back on a on a ter terrain of, of cultural um, pathology so that that's a more comfortable terrain for the for for more for more right-wing um political agents to operate on yeah Thanks for that, uh, Louis. And I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, we have a couple of key points there, right? I mean, you know, the, the this panel has that word populism, right, in quotes and the way that that's been mobilized. And as, as Wendy, you know, says quite pointedly, right, that is often used and mobilized to to actually mask very elite led agendas. Uh, yeah. And and, you know, part of the 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 larger terrain in all of these countries and globally, um, for those of us that are trying to navigate the country we live in, but also learn about countries elsewhere, uh, is the way that we will increasingly hear that a certain political party is fighting the elite or fighting the establishment or is populist. Um, and um, that in and of itself could mean anything. It could mean truly anything. Um, and you see this not only in the Americas, but elsewhere too. You might hear an account that the, the BJP in India is standing up to the establishment and the elite too, uh, you know, while they are also very tied to wealthy business interests and especially uh, funding from uh, uh, outside uh, uh, wealthy people in the West, uh, but it will be characterized as an authentic uh, third world or Eastern movement uh, uh, when actually the, the reality is much more complicated. And that's why this sort of perspective that is intersectional, that is attentive to race, class, gender, and global hierarchies, um, but looks at those all in perspective and doesn't let one slip for the other uh, is perhaps a better approach. Uh, and I think, you know, Louis speaks about that too, right? The way the lived realities uh, of this, the, the, the way this kind of anti-elite, anti-establishment politics can be mobilized, you know, perhaps, as you say, uh, you know, against certain conspicuous people who could be called a jet set, but to what ends, right? To what, to what ends? I want to just shout out a couple of comments um, uh, that have come up. Uh, you know, uh, Alejandra asks about the role of the military uh, in the U.S. or Latin America with respect to populism. Uh, Javier asks about how we can think about Mexico and President AMLO uh, in this messier story. Um, and uh, and Mark talks about, I think this relates to Louis's point, uh, the way uh, that populist movements have often mobilized a kind of nationalism uh, that is not really beneficial to working class people, to more progressive policies. Um, so you see that resonance point 
I, I want to turn to Dave. Um, Dave, you know, um, we uh, we have uh, a question um, that 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 might be relevant. Uh, Subu asks, why has it been so hard for the Democratic Party to build its value, policies, messaging campaigns on a universal working class platform that brings together black, brown and white people? Um, so that's you, you could speak to that uh, and to this larger question that we're getting at, Dave. You know, Mary um, suggested that maybe there is some convergence happening where this notion that the U.S is sort of its own thing uh, and doesn't have these left versus right struggles, um, you know, might be increasingly coming into a new era. How do you see, what are some of the perspectives that we can, can get at to understand uh, politics today and possibilities today? Well, on the, on the question of uh, why it's so hard to build that universal movement, uh, the universal movement is a, a worthy and but also kind of a seductive uh, goal, I think, insofar as the Democratic Party elements in the Democratic Party, going back to this uh, appeal, the Clinton appeal to the uh, white working class or the, or the middle class dreams, uh, universalism becomes a way to not talk about the grievances of indigenous black and brown uh, people and not uh, in the present to support immigrant rights. And so, uh, and that's become a very, very complicated set of questions in which, you know, years ago it was possible for my friend Mike Davis to talk about the Congressional Black Caucus as social democracy uh, in the United States. Now it would be much, much harder to think in those terms and to not regard it as kind of hopelessly split and maybe in some elements tending toward uh, Biden on the one hand and Eric Adams uh, on the other, that kind of style of, of leadership. Um, I wanted to just say uh, two or three things very briefly. Uh, this has been extraordinarily useful uh, for me. I wanted to throw South Africa into the mix as uh, another example of um, the ways in which popular politics are, are conducted in, but also outside of the pre national electoral realm, there's not much that's interesting that uh, is going on in that realm in South Africa, but there's so much uh, campus and township and uh, trade union militancy and struggles over land uh, militancy to the extent that I, I think that we're beginning to see some scholars and some activists uh, realizing that uh, Black South Africans were uh, oppressed as, as Black workers, but they were also uh, oppressed as indigenous people. And so that whole set of questions is, is uh, reasserting itself. Um, maybe I'll just say one other thing. Um, to me, it's, it's been the most shocking thing in the recent past in the United States has been the way that the Buffalo massacre has disappeared from our consciousness. I, was at, I happened to be in DC and went to the national uh, anti-gun uh, rally, and there were some eloquent uh, speakers from, from Buffalo there. But the one particular way that I talk about it is I came into left politics at a moment when uh, white activists at least believed that they had been charged by SNCC and Black Power advocates with going back to the white community and uh, trying to deal with its sicknesses and, and contradictions. And uh, there seems to be no space for that in responding to, to Buffalo. It seems to me that, uh, you know, there, there's anti-fascism on the street and uh, which does uh, good work at times, but to actually try to intervene in the racism of the white community, that is a realm for white activists, either dissolves into being universal and assuming that the only way that you can reach uh, white working class uh, people is uh, on the basis of talking about something other than racial justice and racial violence um, are to, to just give up. And so I, I don't know where to go with this, but I think it's a, I really love Louis' comment that uh, none of these categories can even be taken for granted. Uh, he might have said can ever be taken for granted. I can't read my own handwriting, but either way it works, it works just fine. And uh, I think that, that we're seeing some of the sloppiness around 
uh, who is the white worker, leading us to just think, uh, we don't want to think about this at all. It's too complicated and hopeless to, to think about at all. So thanks. Thanks so much for that. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that really brings home also, um, you know, something that's, I think, resonated uh, across this discussion, um, sort of the, you know, we've talked about the sort of systemic, the electoral, uh, and then the lived, you know, and the lived, uh, you know, at the level of uh, so-called business as usual, when there seems to be business as usual, and, and the lived at the level of crisis, um, that's something like what happened in Buffalo um, reveals um, both both a horror and injustice in itself, uh, and and something that that reveals a larger lived crisis um, uh, uh, that that runs deeper um, and will either be addressed by electoral politics or by political movements of one kind or another, uh, you know, uh, uh, and and be spoken to. Um, I want to I want to see sort of uh if if any of our panelists as we wrap up uh you know i will i will have the last word just to close us out uh but i want to see if any of you want to offer any sort of lightning round final remarks particularly um you know the the sort of themes i'll suggest is sort of any connections or resources or final thoughts so uh if, if you see any sort of points of connection that you want to point to uh, you've already done a very good job in the last round, so so you've done you've done well already. But any sort of points of connection you want to point to, any resources you want to point to uh, that that uh, people can check out, whether it's a website or a magazine or an author or a political movement or whatever, uh, or or final thoughts. So um, I will I will I'm going to go around and ask you to be brief uh, on your uh, resources, connections, or final thoughts. Louis, any resources, connections, or final thoughts? Um, just actually a final thought following up uh, with what uh, David Rodiger said. Um, I think it's key to, to think about the construction of the white worker in relationship to South Africa, also because of the the long uh, shadow of the Carnegie report, the poor white problem and all that kind of stuff, and engaging with the literature on that, actually engaging with South African history on that front has been very useful for me to think about um, how um, the construction of a class identity might look like, um, how it might be mobilized for particular political agendas that are that that are quite different from my own, right? That, um, so that was very useful. Um, so thinking about this through the work of Tiffany Willoughby Harard has been useful. And also uh, the work of Ann Stoller, she's written about this as well. Thanks, Louis. Uh, Wendy, any uh, connections, resources, or final thoughts? Yeah, I have so many resources, but I won't get into them. Um, <laughs> the lots of books to read. Um, but I did want to just comment briefly about uh, white working class and that this concept, um, and also kind of to offer some hope because I know we've been very heavy on the, the side of kind of reality of things. But I know that there was a question earlier about like what hope is there basically going forward. So really briefly, um, I just wanted to say that we have to be careful when we talk about this framework of like white worker and them kind of being the challenge, because if you think about the shooters, almost all of them are middle to upper class white men, um, sometimes college educated, sometimes even more than that. Um, and if you think about the people who are disrupting countless movements as we speak, including unionization efforts in the United States, it's corporate types, right? It's not poor white people who are uh, at the root of this problem in quite the same way that that has been framed in the mainstream press and, and by some others um, who are well-intentioned. Um, but I think we have to be careful when we're, when we're kind of repeating that rhetoric unintentionally. Um, so I see white working class people 
unifying all around the world with people from other racial groups at work, um, in universities, in on campus, off campus, student movements, you know, fill in the blank. There are lots of movements happening in Latin America and the U.S. that I think, as I always say, we sort of sleep on, right? Um, these efforts for Amazon unionization, for Starbucks unionization, I mean, if you look at the people who are involved, it's a multiracial group. And so I think that is potentially a starting place for sort of healing or at least grappling with some of these questions about around racism and how to combine the efforts for making a better life for the working class while at the same time being mindful of the need for um, real racial equality in the process. So I'll, I'll end with that. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, Dave. Connections, resources, final thoughts? Yeah, I very much agree with Wendy about the, the way that it was a very easy leap for the New York Times and others to blame the white working class so-called. The term doesn't make too much sense, but the, but uh, to uh, put Trump onto the white working class when I think it was probably much more uh, a middle class and even upper middle class phenomenon in many uh, areas. Um, for hopefulness, uh, I'd say I assume it's up. The plenary session of the great uh, labor notes conference from last weekend in Chicago, which includes a talk by Chris Smalls and, and Starbucks workers and uh, uh, the new uh, reform president of the Teamsters Union. And it sort of makes the same set of points that uh, that Wendy makes, uh, uh, it makes those points both explicitly and uh, implicitly, but it also has its limits. The, uh, Sean uh, uh, O'Brien, the, the leader of the Teamsters, gave a rousing trade union speech. And then he said, and we have to uh, uh, build upon the people who made this country great, pause, and you thought he was gonna say the working class or the working class uh, the multiracial working class, and he says the middle class. And so I think that there's a lot of ways that we can do better about bringing uh, the kind of reasoned class analysis that Wendy calls for um, into it. Thanks. Mary, uh, connections, resources, final thoughts? Um, I actually want to go back and hear some of Wendy's uh, resources, but um, I will just end by saying I think um, this is a great place to end because I mean there are there is an opposing force to the kind of uh, left wing populism we've been talking about all evening. Um, and I think the question about military and police was pointing towards that. And I would I, I would qualify, I think most of the time when people are talking about white workers, they're not actually talking about working class people because they don't exercise very much political power influence in United, United States or, or in Latin America, but they're really talking about uncredentialed white people. Um, and many of those people end up working for the military and police. And that builds a constituency for, um, you know, the kind of security politics, um, you know, militarization of police um, that we see in both the United States and in places like Brazil um, that black activists have been fighting um, for the last 12 years um, or more. And so I think um, what hope I see is that um, people are calling attention to the, you know, they're politicizing their own deaths and the violence of the state. Um, and that's really changed the conversation around policing. Um, so I think that activists can make a difference. They can raise consciousness. Um, and I do think that any change that's gonna come is going to come from below because um, even intellectuals, I mean, the political class you know, it is itself subject to to what's going on in the base. But I think even intellectuals aren't as good about navigating some of these questions around, you know, how do you organize across lines of difference as working class people are themselves. So I, I really do think that we should probably be followers more than leaders um, in, 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 you know, in going forward. Well, thanks so much for that. Uh, I'll take just a couple of minutes to to wrap up. Uh, I want to I want to thank um, this wonderful wonderful panel. Um, and uh, you know you can you can stay tuned to the to the writings uh, and and of course look these people up online uh, and and see their writings. Uh, uh, Mary Hicks, Wendy Muse. Uh, Louis Raymer or, and, and Tej Nagaraja and myself are on Twitter. 
Uh, Dave uh, Rodiger is uh, has mercifully kept himself uh, off of that for now, I think. Um, and, um, you know, you can certainly look at the, the, the writings of these individuals, um, you know, articles, podcasts, um, and otherwise, and stay tuned to their work. Uh, I encourage people to check out uh, Dave Rodiger's uh, writings and books, especially um, uh, coming out today, The Sinking Middle Class, which you can get wherever you get books, but certainly haymarketbooks.org is a good place. Check out uh, Wendy's uh, Left Pocket uh, project podcast um, uh, and and you can see that on Twitter or on patreon.com slash left POC and I appreciate the other resources that were circulated um, you know uh, Dave mentioned the work of Ruth Wilson Gilmore and sort of thinking about this long arc uh, this turn in economic policy towards a more austere neoliberalism and this more punitive sort of warfare approach not only between countries, but within countries. Um, and as, as our uh, last couple of speakers, Wendy and Mary have spoken to, that's a key resonance uh, between the US and Brazil. Uh, these are two societies that are deeply animated um, by a sort of question of policing and incarceration, uh, constituting a sort of race and class order, remaking a race and class order uh, in the way they target people, certainly centered on poor, Black people, but in ways that affect a wider range uh, of race and class shaped populations and create new subjectivities and response. And as uh, you know, as 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 Dave uh, led us off with, uh, the response to that um, has to navigate electoral politics and, and the terrain of governance. But it often, uh, especially on those fronts, both in the U.S. and Brazil, happens through non-electoral uh, movement politics. Uh, that are in the realm of popular organizing, multiracial working class organizing in labor movements, in movements against police violence uh, and, and otherwise. Uh, I wanna thank um, uh, Dave and Louie and Mary uh, and Wendy. I wanna thank the people uh, that worked on this event from E Cornell and our supporters at the Inaudi Center. Uh, and you can stay tuned to events at E Cornell and you can stay tuned to uh, Class Race Global at twitter.com slash Class Race Global for subsequent events. Uh, and hopefully as we sort of navigate the upcoming elections in Brazil and the United States, as well as these sort of popular struggles for economic justice, racial justice, and global justice, um, some, of these, some of these panelists will have put a bug in your ear in these conversations to see those connections um, as we sort of pay attention to specific sites, specific struggles, local issues, specific issues, um, the, the opportunity uh, that really comes with seeing how inextricable they are. Uh, uh, hopefully these conversations contribute to that. And I wanna thank all of the uh, hundreds of people that have tuned in live. Uh, and of course you can share that same link with, with other people to, um, to, to watch the recorded video. Uh, so please do spread the word. Uh, thanks so much everybody.